data is control. I'm going to give you four reasons why you should care if companies want to track your data and save it to the phone or send it over the internet. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to split it from the longest range to the shortest range. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the impacts of society as the, uh, the fourth point. So when it comes to the long range, uh, which I consider basically to be the internet as a whole, because then it's as long range as possible, the whole world. Um, and this is like, this is important. Information shared over the internet doesn't always stay private forever, right? Like that totally makes sense. Like that seems pretty obvious, I imagine for a lot of you. So long range. Companies have data leaks all the time, for example, reports um, that over a half a billion Facebook users, personal information, including their names, phone numbers, and email addresses was leaked, um, that it was shown in April 2021 this year, just like a few months ago, right? So, so many of you are already familiar with this. Now, the other thing, um, because of GDPR, we're learning that companies can also be obligated by governments to reveal this personal information in the name of national security. So when this information is given to the government, often you as a user are not aware of what's happening. They, they are not required. In fact, they are forbidden from telling you that your information is being tracked. There are specific uh, rules and regulations that prevent that from prevent you from knowing what is happening. So Whistleblower Edward Snowden popped the lid on how cell phone locations are tracked by your own cell phone companies, and they are shared with governments on a regular basis. And, you know, honestly, even years after this revelation, they have not stopped creeping our locations. Like, if you have a cell phone today, your location is being tracked. Sorry, um, that's nothing's changed in terms of this behavior. Um, because it's still part of the rules and regulations of what is allowed. So um, next up is short range. And I'm going to go back to um, some of the stuff I just mentioned, because I think this, this is important. So when it comes to um, short range communications, short range communications technology like um, near field communication or NFC, uh, is often used for payment systems and uh, such as like Apple Pay or um, I imagine Google's uh, Pay is exactly the same. Uh, there's another technology that is being discussed um, that you may have heard in that video that I showed earlier. Uh, Apple said that it uses ultra wide band for unlocking cars, uh, hotel rooms, and homes. So what is ultra wide band or UWB? Um, so ultra wide band is basically a, a kind of like a, a, a car, like it's kind of the in between between like really short range NFC, which only has a few inches uh, distance that it can support and uh, Bluetooth, which is like, you know, a um, couple hundred feet. So ultra wide bands range is about 25 meters. Uh, and that's convenient for both you and for hackers. <laughs> so um, in the UK, the vehicle recovery company uh, called Tracker reported that 92% of all vehicles stolen and recovered were taken without the using the owner's keys. You didn't they don't need to take your keys no more in order to steal your car. Attackers have been using something called a, like a two person relay attack to enter cars. So the way that this works is let's pretend um, you're here, this is your car. So there are two people that are following you. So one person will follow you as maybe you enter the train station, just give you an example. And then another person is still going to stay near your car. And what they're going to do is they're going to send this signal, this ultra wideband signal that comes from your car, um, wirelessly to the let's say the backpack, maybe he's got a laptop or something um, to another person. And so it will look um, that signal will look like your 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 phone or your key fob, like it'll start to think that you're actually close to the car, 
Uh, so what it will do is it will unlock the doors for you. And so what will happen is like you're really far away. This person has not touched you. They're not even close to you because they can be 25 meters away and your, your doors are unlocked. Uh, then from that point, it's pretty easy to enter the vehicle um, and just like steal whatever stuff is inside or potentially even take the vehicle to some location. For example, like drive it to a shipping container or something and then have it shipped somewhere somewhere else so that it can be anonymized or reprogrammed, etc. So don't think that this stuff can't be done. It's like 92% of all vehicles stolen are, are stolen using that technology, the ultra wideband. And it's not just Apple that's using this. Like every car manufacturer uses like the same technology, ultra wideband. That's how you're able to walk in and then everything's unlocked. How convenient. Um, and so the key here is that your if they can steal from you without leaving any evidence of any forced entry. So you would, for the most part, be none the wiser unless you kind of looked in your glove compartment and you're like, hey, something's missing here. But like, how often do people look in their glove compartment? Do they check every day? Do they check every two days? This is this is the problem. Now, there's ways to protect yourself, right? Like you, there are portable, they call them Faraday pouches, um, like the silent pocket uh, that can block these signals. But keep in mind, you would also like if this if you're putting a cell phone like your iPhone into a uh, Faraday pouch like the silent pocket, you would also lose the convenience of all the stuff that cell phones are good for, like receiving text messages or calls on your phone. Uh, it basically would block all signals um, from entering your phone. So th these types of pockets like silent pockets are more common um, in like for your key fob. So typically people will actually put a cover on their key fob and then they will use that in order to uh, block other people from using it. So when you need the, to use it, they, they just remove the, the pocket and then that's one, one way that they can protect themselves. Now, I've talked about Wi-Fi, so that's the highest level, the longest distance, the internet, right? Like so, once once it's there, it's very easy for many people to get access to it. Uh, it could be official sources, it could be like people within the company leaking your information, uh, or it could be governments like uh, compelling a company to release that information. Ultra wideband is really just about like I can steal your information without being close to you or without you even noticing. I just walk, you know, near you is sufficient for me to unlock your something like your vehicle or potentially your house or your hotel keys, you name it, right? Like those those kind of things are fairly easy to spoof if they're all using ultra wideband technology. Ultra wideband has 25 meter range. That's fairly easy to, to spoof. Um, the last one is like straight up hardware hacking. So if you have a phone, you know, if you can plug something into it, like a cable that connects to a computer, um, it's hackable. But here's the key. Okay, and so the, my last one, I'm going to just talk about like straight up hardware hacking, and I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about this technique. So one of the key messages regarding the changes to Apple Wallet, and you you heard this back in when I was talking about the the report over here, uh, direct from Apple, was that this data would be encrypted, and it would only be accessible through the secure Enclave processor. Uh, which is also similar to the secure element available in Snapdragon 845 or above Android phones. So I want to be clear, this is not exclusive to Apple phones, but this is certainly how they advertise that we're keeping your information secure. So um, under the hood, secure enclave or secure element manages encryption keys uh, and it's isolated from the main processor. So it is built into the chip. So you have a Snapdragon or you have an Apple, uh, like say an M1 chip, uh, and then it's built into that processor. So it is a component of it. However, they isolate it on purpose. So the goal is any highly sensitive data um, that users want to keep private, like it could be like your, your face scans, could be your fingerprint scans or credit cards, like they want to make sure that that's encrypted. So they, they find a special place in memory for it. So they quote unquote, reserve it uh, for for these this encrypted uh, component. Uh, and in this isolation, in theory means that it's capable of maintaining its encryption of your this really sensitive data, 
even if you jailbreaked the device. So if you even if you hacked the device, you got into what what's known as the root or the kernel. Um, in theory, like oh, you should have access to everything, but no, that shouldn't be the case. In theory, uh, with the secure enclave, it's a different type of processor. You would actually have to hack the secure enclave processor. Um, and so what that means is that you know this. Oh, it, it like potentially protects you. However, <laughs> let's see if I have that here. Um, I don't have it. Uh, I have an article that showed that because Secure Enclave is a piece of hardware, uh, information is located in ROM and it cannot be changed. When an exploit is discovered for Secure Enclave, it, that exploit will work for every phone moving back till whenever that was patched. And this is a real problem because it means if you have an older phone, then you are always going to be susceptible to this hack and there's nothing that they can do about it. So potentially like anybody who like recently, I think it was in 2021. I mean, there's always security groups that are, are doing research on this stuff. Like, like they showed a new exploit for secure enclave uh, that they, they said is unpatchable. The reason it's unpatchable because it's built into the ROM of Secure Enclave. So you would need a new hardware. You would need a new processor uh, to fix this problem. And so I'm sure they're going to do everything that they can to prevent this uh, from happening, like for prevent you from like accessing the kernel and getting access to the device. But if somebody physically has your device and like plugs this thing in, they're probably going to be able to get to a lot of that data, which is a problem. Um, and like, of course, they're not showing exactly how how it happens, uh, but you know, suffice it to say, like things are on a device, people will try to hack it. I mean, this is this is very common, right? Like, remember when the the U.S. government like really wanted access to uh, a terrorist phone, and you know they they were like, oh, how do I do it? And then just like probably some company, security company, just called them up and were like, hey, what's up? We can hack that phone for you. Here, just give us some money, <laughs> and then and then we got you. So, so that's that's the uh, the key uh, with respect to that one. Okay. So the last one I'm going to talk about. Uh, is uh, regarding uh, society. And I think that this is important um, because we often talk about technology and we don't talk about what does this mean for our society. And I think that this is where it becomes really, really interesting because the it's the society implications that are the most, uh, they're the most fascinating. If Apple and others truly succeed, in replacing your existing wallet, uh, this introduces another, like a new risk to our society as a whole. Uh, and I, I do want to give credit to data diva Debbie Reynolds once again. She helped me think a, a lot about the implications of what this means for our society. She's awesome. So now imagine this scenario. If the government only issued an electronic driver's license and a passport to your phone. So they, they didn't give you a physical one, they only gave you the electronic one. Well then, in theory, you're only one hack away from full-on identity theft, right? Like, so they could pretend to be you in every sense of the word. They could travel as you, like they would, they would be you effectively. Like you could change the photo. Let's say you change the photo, right? The, the way that people like cut out the photo, like replacing a photo is e easier than like faking a passport. Um, they would literally become you. They would have your credit card. They would be able to travel as you. They would be able to cross borders as you. Um, they would be you uh, in, in all senses of the word in the digital sense. The second risk with this is uh, society risk is one of concentrated power. So your phone manufacturer could shut down your account at any time and they would have no obligation to restore any of your accounts. Even if you had, say, life-saving medication in your car that you're locked out of because your phone account got either compromised by somebody else or violated the terms of service, who knows what. Uh, or even if you couldn't, let's say you couldn't get back into your own house because you left your keys at home because you're like, ah, I don't need those keys anymore. I just, I leave everything at home because if I ever need it, I'll just go home and get it. Oops, and you got locked out. <laughs> so 
says face ID, fingerprint ID, and two-factor authentication helps to secure these connections, though. Okay, so I agree. Um, those are things, those are all things that help. Anything that you can do to not rely on a single um, s source is, is going to help. But think about the scenario, right? Like, so even if you've got like face ID, like you've got two-factor authentication, the issue that I'm, I'm referring to here is one of like the higher level, um, either the government or the company Apple decides to shut down your account. Um, and maybe this has never happened to you before, but you wouldn't be surprised. There are people who have lost access to their Google accounts. They have lost access to their Apple accounts. Uh, I, for, for one, have lost access to my Google account. I can't remember. I think I sent an email to like a, a group or a list uh, by accident. You know how like sometimes you like BCC or you like CC everybody? And I'm like, oops, I sent it. Um, and then I think they, yeah, they flagged my email account and then they shut everything down and like you lose access to everything. It's scary. Uh, and so though, how do you protect yourself from that type of risk? Uh, in this case, I think that it's always good uh, to have a backup just in case the electronics don't work. Now, it could be like maybe at that time, your cell phone doesn't have a connection. And this is key for uh, a lot of the Apple Pay. It doesn't work unless you've got a working internet connection. Um, so generally, like I, for one, like keep all of my cash and my cards um, in an RFID blocking minimalist wallet. So it's like this small, this small one, my most important card, Costco the only one that is not digital. <laughs> I, I don't have a choice. It's like, you don't need to bring your wallet. You don't need your passport. You don't need your driver's license. You need your Costco card. <laughs> I don't know how many of you are like that as well. Uh, but yeah, Costco card, very important. So uh, I have some examples of RFID blocking uh, minimalist wallets. Um, you can keep them with you at all times. I highly recommend it if you can, just in case. Um, don't leave home without it. You know, honestly, if you can, having a spare key doesn't hurt either. Like if you can find it like a super thin one that like just fits inside a card, like just a credit card, uh, those are kind of the ideal if if you can, like a physical key. Um, but everybody's different, right? Like, you know, anything can be hacked, anything can be compromised. Um, so if people really want to get in, they're going to get in. It's just about the amount of effort. And, you know, for the most part, digital... Um, Digital solutions for like the secure enclave are very hard to hack. Like it, it's much easier to like break into your house than it is to hack secure enclave. Like you need really strong technical expertise, like world leading um, te technical expertise to hack it. Doesn't mean it can't be done, but it does mean that the number of people that can do it to you is much less.